Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me and for tuning in today. I'm really looking forward to presenting. So I'm going to be presenting on design thinking for AI strategy. If something resonates from this talk, during this talk, uh, or after this talk, please share on social media any nuggets that you get. I'll give you a moment to just take a screen grab of this if you want to have it as a reference or take a picture or something. You can use uh, these tags on LinkedIn or these hashtags on uh, LinkedIn or Twitter. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat> okay. So who am I? My name's Natalie. I've been in tech for 15 years. My roles have primarily been in tech and focused on three main areas, strategy, user experience, design, and product management. I've also done bits of project management, customer success, diversity, and inclusion. And for the past 10 years or so, those roles that I've held have been mainly in leadership. I'm also an advisor, a consultant, a coach, and a startup investor, and sometimes I'm a startup judge as well. Um, I've worked in a variety of contexts from small and large startups like Taima, Ross Intelligence, Wave Financial, uh, and, dif and different ventures with the Ryerson University Social Ventures Incubator, as well as working for large companies like Shopify, Rogers, and most recently BMO, where, um, where I was uh, working as director of AI strategy. I've also run my own business as an entrepreneur. So that's a little bit about me. So what you'll learn today. Um, today, I'm going to uh, walk you through three main things, and what I'd like you to take out of today, hopefully, is uh, one, an understanding of a design thinking framework, including uh, how it looks when it's just a traditional design thinking framework and how it looks when AI is part of the solution. Secondly, how you can apply design thinking as part of the AI strategy. And three, why a problem first versus an AI first approach is important. So here's what we're going to cover in our 30 minutes today. We're already uh, part of the way through the intro. So the next things we'll cover are, I'll do a little bit of level setting. Um, and then I'm going to present the design thinking framework. We'll be spending most of our time on item three. And then I'll also be walking you through a little bit of how um, the design thinking framework looks like when it's integrated into an overall AI strategy. And then I'll give you a quick little alternating lens uh, for AI versus design thinking. And I've got some resources at the end and then we'll open it up for the Q&A. So before we dive in uh, into design thinking specifically, I'm going to do a little bit of level setting. I'm going to be showing you a few different frameworks, a couple of things that uh, are meaningful to me from an AI perspective. Um, right now, they're probably going to seem a little bit varied. You won't necessarily see the connection between them, and that's okay. Don't. Um, there's no pressure here to absorb this all right now or to understand how it's all connected. It's just a, a quick little snapshot and overview of various things that I will uh, be connecting. So don't worry too much about it just take it in and then we'll uh, we'll keep going from there so the first one is uh, the this uh, this quote and diagram that most of us have probably seen by now uh, by Andrew Ning and I find it's a good reminder that AI is an umbrella term for many subset types of AI and it's not an interchangeable term for things like machine learning deep learning or data science um, this is also potentially a good point to think about where you see yourself in your organization in relation to this diagram right now. Um, this is another uh, thing that most of us are probably really familiar with by now, again, by Andrew Ning. And um, I also find this one really useful in relation to design thinking and AI in particular. And the reason why is in the excitement about AI, there can be a tendency to want to start with AI first, to want to find a way to apply it. But as someone coming from a strategy, product, and UX background, where we start with a problem first, even though I'm also really excited about the power of AI, I don't think of AI first. I think of human problems first and business problems first. And I think of AI as one potential ways to solve those problems. And so in the same way that with electricity, when electricity um, became available, it was super exciting. There was lots and lots of things that we could do with electricity. There are some human problems that just if we think with an electricity first mindset are not going to be the kinds of things that they're still very important, but they're not going to be ones that we're going to solve with electricity. So for example, as humans, we need a place to sleep, a bed, and if we think from a needs perspective first, we'll think of all kinds of solutions for where to sleep. If we think from an electricity uh, lens first, the solutions might not become as apparent. So uh, in summary, uh, the do, 
the big do from my talk is to start from a uh, problem first, a needs first, not an AI or machine learning first um, lens. There's some other frameworks here. Uh, one ties in design thinking, um, lean, agile. So these are different ones, especially if you've been in the startup world that you may have come across. Design thinking is primarily interested in exploring the problem. Lean or lean startup, which you may be familiar with, is, is mainly interested with building the right thing. And agile is especially interested in building um, the, the thing right. So uh, just again, don't try to connect all of these right now, just some different frameworks that you may have uh, come across and, and to keep in mind. So the one that I'm gonna be focusing on most today, although there will be elements of the other two in here as well, will be the design thinking with a special focus on exploring the problem. So the design thinking framework. Design thinking is all about starting with the human problem first. And that human problem can be a user problem, a customer problem, or a business problem. It's all humans involved in those different areas. Um, and by problem, I'm thinking need first. So it's to understand the need really well, and then to understand the problems that exist in the related opportunities. And then, so that's the understand piece. And then it's about uh, thinking up and exploring potential solutions. And then thirdly, it's about bringing those solutions to life, learning how well they work and improving on them. So design thinking broken down has several sub stages. There are a few different variations of the design thinking uh, stages and frameworks. I like this one by the Nielsen Norman group. So for the bulk of the rest of this presentation, I'll be walking you through each of these sub stages, what they are, why they're important, what activities they include, and what kinds of outputs come out of each of them. And I'll be highlighting what that looks like in a traditional non-AI project, and then what gets added in when AI is part of the solution. So you'll remember that I was talking about understanding, exploring, and materializing. So you can see that the sub-stages map to each of those high-level stages. And to help us better understand the different stages, I'll use an example we can all relate to and understand throughout the rest of the talk. So as, um, as a user, let's, let's imagine there's a user who's consumed some kind of content. We're all familiar with consuming content on Amazon and Netflix. Um, let's imagine in this case, it's a user who's uh, consumed some kind of content on a website and who's interested in finding more content that they like. And for example purposes, again, let's also imagine that in this context, there's a business of that website um, that this user is on that wants to make some money from advertising on or within its content. So we've got a user who wants more content that they're interested in, similar to what they've already consumed, and a business that has some revenue that they wanna make, so they have some business goals. So first big part of the design thinking uh, framework is to understand the opportunity. So there's two parts to that. The two subsets are to empathize with the user and business need and to define the problem and opportunity. So empathizing, what is empathizing? Empathizing is about gaining a deep understanding of the problems and realities of the people and organizations you're designing for. And why is that important? What's the goal there? Well, it's important because it helps us gather context on the current state of the problem space, the who, the what, the when, the where, the how, so that we can understand the user or customer need and the organizational need. It helps us to make sure that we're gonna solve real problems for the user in the business. Empathy also helps us have a motivation to solve that problem. If we get to a place of deep empathy for the need and the problem, theoretically, we'll be more motivated to solve that problem. So if we go back to our example of a, a user who wants to find more content that might interest them, we might observe how a user finds that currently perhaps searching with keywords, and understand from the business what goals they have. For example, it could be that they want to increase loyalty to their company or to their website, and they want to increase, increase revenue for that company. So what that looks like in a traditional model, um, so the little icon on the left is the, the activities, and the one at the bottom is for outputs. So in a traditional model, 
We would gain empathy by doing things like contextual research to observe what the customer does, says, thinks, feels. We might do interviews with the customer or with the user. We might meet with the business to understand the current and desired state of the business and, and any related metrics. And some outputs that might come out of that, there's quite a few, but some example ones might be that we have an empathy map. We might create a user journey or storyboard that helps to summarize uh, that and we might um, have a list of organizational requirements. If we factor in AI as part of the as part of the potential solution, although we'll only know that in a couple more steps. But um, if you're an AI team working and you're at the empathy stage, then you're also potentially going to want to think about, um, and this would probably be more your data analysts and data scientists, but identify prospective data sources that could help to inform insights about the current needs and goals. So beyond the qualitative and quantitative data that we might find by actually interacting with the users themselves, we could look for what kind of data would give us uh, insights that could help us. And some outputs that might come from that might be lists of prospective analytics data and some preliminary tech requirements. Our next stage, so this is the second of the two stages to help us understand the opportunity, is um, defining. And defining is all about identifying the problem or opportunity. So now that we've done some understanding of pains and needs, we now want to kind of hone in on what the problem and opportunity is. So this is where we would combine the research findings, define what and where the customer and business problems are, and identify specific opportunities for innovation. Why is it important to do this define, identify problem and opportunity stage? It's to make sure we're focusing on the most important problems. The problems that if we were to solve them would make the biggest impact for customers and for the organization. So again, if we go back to our example, um, of wanting to provide someone with more content that might interest them. In the define phase, we would use the data gathered in the empathize phase to gain insights into customer and organization current state, so what, what is going well, what is a pain for them, and where there are opportunities in the form of unmet needs. In terms of the traditional side of DEFINE, some example outputs that might come out of that are a synthesis of the research findings, a problem or job statement, some personas potentially of our target audience or target users. And once we layer in AI, if AI is part of the solution, then we might for the stage before where we identified some data that might help us have insights, at this stage, we might be summarizing the analytics insights and recommendations for the business. And that might result in an output that's analytic findings and recommendations. So in terms of the actual problem and job statement, as an output, just to give you an example of what that might look like in a traditional environment. So we might have something like a job story where we summarize everything into a simple statement that everybody can remember to help guide the rest of our projects. So when a user is in this situation, as this type of user, they want to do this so that they can get this benefit. So this is an example of the kind of output we might have. So our second big stage is the explore solution stage, and that's made up of two sub stages, which is ideating and defining. The first of those two sub stages, the ideate stage, is about brainstorming solutions and innovating. And what that's comprised of in more detail is brainstorming a range of creative ideas that address the unmet user and business needs identified in the previous defined phase. And it's about sharing ideas, gathering feedback, and building on those ideas. And why this is important, it's to make sure that we're exploring a range of ideas, that we're not just falling back on the traditional ideas, the first ones that come to mind. It ensures that we're innovating and that we're also taking um, inspiration from each other's ideas and then building on those. And so again, back to um, our example, if we want to provide someone with more content that may interest them, in the IDA phase, we would explore many different ways of surfacing other content users might be interested in that would also help the business meet their goals. In a traditional environment, if we look at this slide, 
um, in terms of activities, we might do something like a cross-discipline brainstorm of ideas that to meet the customer and organizational needs. We might do design studio sessions, which are sessions where you get cross-discipline teams together and you uh, share the problem statement and then come up with all sorts of ways that you might solve that. An output from that in a traditional context might be some rough concepts, some rough designs or mock-ups, some rough technical approaches. Um, and if you consider an AI project, then you would also be doing some brainstorming around potential AI models and outputs, some brainstorming of prospective data sources. And the outputs that might come out of that are uh, an identification of potential data sources, an identification of potential models, and some business and technical requirements that we would need to take into account from an AI perspective. Um, stage four, substage four, um, is the prototype phase. So for this one, we're all we're interested in creating and building solutions. So what this is all about is that we're looking to build real tactile, tactile in some way, tangible representations of the solution that will allow us to get feedback from representative customers and from the business. Why this is important to understand what parts of our ideas work and which don't from the perspective of customers and business representatives. And it's also to get feedback on requirements and feasibility. So in a traditional sense, we might build a tangible representation of an idea that a customer could envision and or use that might be in the form of a paper prototype, it could be an interactive prototype, something that makes an idea real and visual for our target audience, whether it's um, a website user or it's a, um, a business. And then if we're looking at a project that involves AI, then at this stage, the activities um, might involve selecting a model approach, accessing, splitting, and exploring data, training a model, debugging, analyzing, and tuning a model. And the outputs there might be um, uh, data aggregation, exploration, visualization, a proof of concept. Um, and so that's stage four. This is making our um, ideas real. Next, we move on to our third and final main phase of design thinking, which is about materializing the solutions. And so this involves two substages, which is testing and implementing. These are two ways that we're materializing the solution. The first of these, which is testing the solution, what that's all about is making the prototype that we created available to customers and to the organization to obtain user and organizational feedback. And why that's important is to understand if the solution that we've created actually meets the customer and business needs. To see things like, has it improved how they feel? How they are able to meet their goals? Has it solved the problem that we identified at the earlier stage? So in a traditional sense, testing our solution might be to user test our prototype. So we might have an output that's user test sessions and the findings from those test sessions. And in an AI context, it might be about validating and tuning the model, showing the model results and getting some feedback on that. Um, and then we would have as an output, uh, the initial model outputs and then some iterations on that. And if we go back to our example, at the prototype phase, for a user who's interested in more interesting content, we could show them um, an actual visual or interactive representation of additional recommended content, and then observe if and how they engage with it. And now our sixth and final substage of our materialized uh, main stage is implement is the implement stage. So that's all about launching, learning, and refining our solution. So in more detail, what that's about is once you're satisfied that your solution meets the needs of your audience based on the previous test stage, this stage consists of implementing, aka launching the solution and gathering lots of additional feedback and data on it in order to iterate and refine it further. Why this is important, until a solution is in the actual hands of a customer and having real impact for organizations, it's not yet providing true value or, relying, or allowing us to refine it based on real impact data. So everything else we've done doesn't really matter until this stage because 
it's not having an actual impact in the world. So it's really important to get to this stage. Some other uh, design thinking frameworks don't actually include this stage, which is why I chose this particular model. It's a really important stage. So in a traditional sense, what an implementation might look like is to launch the solution so it reaches real customers and has real impact for the organization. It could have an output of a product um, that's launched either in beta or in full. Um, or some kind of service that's released. And in an AI context where AI is part of the solution, this would involve as activities productionizing the model, experimenting and gradual release of the model, monitoring the model, maintaining it, and iteratively uh, retraining it. And so some outputs might be the model in production and data for retraining. So back to our example, for a user who's interested in more interesting content, we would launch a solution that services actual additional recommended related content, and then we would gather qualitative and quantitative feedback and refine the solution further for ongoing improvement and accuracy. There's one key difference that it's critical to highlight when contrasting more traditional solutions to ones involving AI, and that's the importance of shifting from a certainty mindset to a probabilistic mindset. An AI solution might not lead to the desired result, but that does not necessarily mean the model is not, is not a high quality model. For example, if a model recommends content to a customer that it has rated as highly probable of being a fit for that user, and the user still does not consume it, it was only ever a probability, not a certainty, that it would be a fit for that user. So even, for example, with a 95% probability that the recommendation would be one that would be of interest to the user, um, there's still a chance that the user, for a variety of reasons, won't consume the content. And that doesn't mean the model was bad or wrong. So we need to take that into account when we're testing our results and when we're uh, gathering data after launching and implementing a solution. Um, as opposed to a traditional model, which is more deterministic and has more certainty on the AI side, it's more of a probability as opposed to a certainty. Okay, so integrating design thinking for AI strategy, I'm just going to briefly touch on this. Um, and so call back to the design thinking framework here where we have our understand, explore, materialize, understands about empathizing, about defining, exploring is about ideating and prototyping, and materializing is about testing and implementing. And so this is just a quick example. It's not as comprehensive as what I went through in the previous stages. But if we look at the top row as a traditional UX project where everything uh, in black text doesn't include an AI uh, related solution, we can notice that as soon as something goes to an AI project, um, the parts in orange, for example, are some things that would be added. But we still see that in the initial two stages in an AI project or a traditional project, we're still really Really focused on the same stages and that's about empathizing and defining and that if we take an only AI approach versus a traditional design thinking approach we would start only at the third stage potentially which would leave out that really important piece of um, user and business driven problem identification. So in summary, applying the needs and problem first approach of design thinking to our project strategy can enhance that process. And it can help ensure that in our enthusiasm to apply AI, we continue to take a user and business problem first approach to make sure we're tackling the most important problems first and applying AI as a solution where it makes the most sense to do so rather than looking for opportunities to apply AI that might cause us to overlook critical needs and problems that could benefit users and businesses, even if they don't require an AI solution. Like with electricity, AI provides more and more opportunities to solve problems and user problems in an incredible way, way with AI, but AI won't be the solution for everything. An alternating lens. Um, so remember what I said about starting with the problem and not with AI as a solution? Well, now, I, now that I've stressed the importance of that and you've taken that approach as a default, it can now be useful <clears throat> to flip the lens to an AI first approach. 
and ask ourselves, if knowing the power of AI, we look through an AI first lens, what additional opportunities and needs might we be able to offer to benefit our users and businesses? So if, if we start with the needs first approach as uh, in the left column, we might come to a needs one solution uh, that comes to mind that then uh, maps over to an AI capability. And sometimes, for need one, we might not think if we're not thinking through an AI lens of another solution that's actually available that when we flip it and we look through the lens of AI capability one, we now think of a new solution that maybe we wouldn't have thought of and so on and so on. So it can be useful, although I recommend starting with a problem first approach to then flip it and look at it from the AI first approach afterwards. Um, so to recap, the three things that we've learned today and that I hope that you're taking away. First is a design thinking framework that can help guide you, whether you're in an AI context or not, in terms of project. Two, how you could apply design thinking as part of an AI strategy. And three, why a problem first versus an AI first approach is important, but also how you can then apply an AI first approach to come up with some additional solutions and innovations. I also have a list of resources that I'm happy to share after the talk. There's uh, various design thinking inspiration solutions, and then there's some other resources and references here that um, are specific to UX as well as some, um, some of the really well-known AI basic foundational uh, resources and some of the things that I drew, uh, some of what we saw in this talk. Philip was asking, uh, what are the most common mistakes that occur within the six step process in AI context? Where do AI ML teams waste most time? What is most neglected? Um, that's a great question. Uh, so I heard what is, um, what is skipped or what's missed and where can there be some wasting of time? I think, uh, I think sometimes uh, what I was talking about in terms of the real importance of starting with the user first and the, and the problem first approach, I think businesses and AI teams are very, very excited about applying AI. And obviously that is the reason for being for AI teams in particular. So I think sometimes that starting from an AI lens first approach is something that I've observed. Um, and there can be a desire to see where we can where we can apply that, where are all the places we can apply that, as opposed to um, what I what I find really helpful to do is to look from a okay, what presumably a business has come up with a strategy and they have some high level strategic goals that they're trying to achieve as a business. And then I like to think about the work that I do laddering up to those. So I would think about if these are the things the business is trying to achieve and given some of the needs that we've identified that the users of that business or the customers of that business have, what are some of the biggest problems and then where does it make sense to consider AI for those as opposed to going in from the AI first perspective? But at the same time, especially for AI specific teams, since that's their whole raison d'etre, they're there for that reason, I do think it's really important that they be looking through that AI first lens as well. It just, um, it should be in complement or in parallel to looking at a user and business needs first perspective. Does that answer the question? I would say so. And uh, part of the other question was, uh, where do you think uh, AI ML teams uh, waste the most time in, in that project? Mm. You know, I, from my observation, I think some of the challenges are wasted time is less about the team itself um, wasting time. Although that can happen if we didn't do a good enough job really making sure we're solving the right problems. But otherwise, I think sometimes, depending on the organization, uh, if there's a lot of approval process, if there's a lot of um, uh, hierarchy, those kind of things can get in the way of, of moving quickly. But then again, given the 
potentially really big impact of AI and some of the ways that if it's not done well, there can be harm for the business or the user. It, the, you know, you have to balance wanting to move quickly and have impact really quickly with doing your due diligence to make sure that you're, you know, being ethical and you're being um, thorough and you're making sure that you're actually building AI uh, based on, you know, for example, good data and, and uh, ethical approaches. So I think it's a balance. Um, and again, so to recap, I think it's uh, sometimes outside of the AI team's control, what, what ends up uh, taking extra time. And the other part that is within their control is, are they always making sure that the work is being mapped to the most critical uh, business and user needs? Thank you so much for that, Philip and Natalie. That's great. Um, I've got a question here from Robbie uh, at uh, Ultra ML. I think that's uh, in Calgary there. Um, he's asked, uh, does it help to build wireframes for ML AI products even before building a proof of concept model? Um, so I would say whether it's a wireframe or some other kind of concept, I do think that it can be really useful. I think that... Um, I think it, it, it supports that attempt to put the, the model work that we're doing within the context of the problem in the business, right? And so um, if we can help everyone align around, like a model by itself is going to be clear and obvious to really technical people, but for it to have meaning for users and have meaning for the business, particularly non-technical uh, business stakeholders, you need to put it in the context of an actual need on the business end or a need from the user end. And you have to also be able to test and validate it um, from the perspective of those needs. And so for that reason, being able to have some kind of visual concept that's less technical, so it's the work that you're doing, it's the whether it's the UI that the AI will be integrated into or some other visualization, having that will be very useful. So to answer the question, it doesn't need to be a wireframe. Um, in some cases, for example, we've done mock-ups or we've done... Um, interactive prototypes that show uh, the intended functionality that an AI would support. And definitely those things really bring it to life, both to get excitement and enthusiasm and to help non-technical people understand what this thing is going to do, and then to really map it back to the needs and, and support the testing that you need to do. A paper prototype, what is that exactly? Mm -hmm. Sure, so that can be, um, that can be, for example, you've literally just sketched something out and you have two or three pieces of paper that demonstrate a, a series of interactions that you intend. So, for example, if we use the example of the person who wants to see content, if I just want to quickly get their feedback on something, I don't need to actually spend time designing it in Photoshop or creating a front end um, you know, front end uh, proof of concept or doing anything in code, I could literally just take a piece of paper, do some rough sketches um, on it to show like some boxes or where I might put related content showing up in the website and then put it in front of the user and say, hey, if you saw this, what would you choose next or what would you want to see or how closely would this meet your needs? And then have a few backup pieces of paper that show alternate views that if they say something like, well, I wouldn't want to see that. I'd want to see this. If you happen to have thought of that, you could bring that forward and go, you mean like this? And then get their feedback. Or you could ask them to sketch it out. Or you could show them a series of things. So say, on this sheet, what well, they select? They show you, and then you bring something else up that is your intention of what they would see next to get their feedback. So it's really just a fancy way of saying drawings on paper that you alternate and let them choose from 